Okay, we'll go ahead and um, get started here. Um, my name is Rob Moon. I am the uh, PM on the uh, Project Catapult Academic Program um, and the one that's been spamming everybody with information. Um, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Um, we're going to share a little bit about Project Catapult Academic and um, if you if you have questions, um, feel free to um, unmute and ask, or if you want to uh, throw them into um, the IM window, we can um, we can do it that way as well. Um, we're going to start off this morning. Um, Derek's going to give us a little bit of a, a overview, kind of an introduction, what the project's about. Uh, and then we're going to roll into a uh, presentation on the microarchitecture of um, of the project. So, Derek, if you want to go ahead and uh, kick us off, we'll go. All right. Can you all hear me? Come yes. On. Okay. Yes. Great. Okay, so thank you all for uh, for getting up for some of you early, uh, for, for others of you it's not too early, but thanks for everyone for attending. Um, we're going to be talking about the, the Catapult Academic Program. I'm just going to give an overview, uh, as, as Rob said. Uh, I copied these slides from a previous tutorial, so sorry for the incorrect names. Um, Dan Zhang is still affiliated with us, um, uh, but uh, we, we, uh, Ray, Ray Ma will be uh, replacing him there, and Andrew Putnam is still working on this. So can you go to the next slide? All right, so for those of you who don't know this, and, and Rob, I don't know if you can fix this, but what we're seeing is we're seeing both screens, uh, the presentation screen as well as the uh, the regular screen. Is that true for everyone? Can you guys all see both screens? That's right. Yeah, so I mean, it, if, if you can fix it, that'd be great. If, if not, that's probably okay. So what Catapult is, is a configurable cloud that's being deployed in Microsoft's data centers. So in fact, we are deploying these uh, in, in every uh, major data center server, we're, we're deploying these in Azure and Bing, and, and there are actually other properties, other, other groups within Microsoft that are deploying them. This is entirely Microsoft-designed hardware, firmware, and software. So this is uh, something that uh, Microsoft started a while ago and has been working on for some time. Um, and what it does is it allows us to pro provide differentiated hardware performance for each uh, service and server. So what that means is uh, if the server happens to be a Bing server, which is the same hardware as the Azure server, the Bing server can go and be optimized for Bing as opposed to the Azure server, which is optimized for Azure. So this is something that, that allows us to have flexibility while still maintaining kind of the same basic hardware, underlying hardware infrastructure. The FPJ infrastructure enables application development as well as um, as, as well as infrastructure. So these are the two things that uh, we can accelerate networking. We can also implement uh, DNNs on our, on our system. Um, so as I said, this is an in production in Microsoft data centers. Um, we're doing search acceleration and software defined networking acceleration today. Those are what we're public about. And over time, you'll, you'll hear more announcements about other things we're doing with FPGAs. Um, so next slide. All right, so I'm sure that all of you have seen this slide uh, before, um, but uh, what this is fundamentally saying is that uh, microprocessors are great, they're very flexible, but they are really inefficient when it comes to uh, comparing against uh, dedicated hardware. So next, can you click one more? So if you go and look at this processor die photo, right, this is, a, this is an Intel processor. It looks like it's got four cores. And you, you go and compute the number of pixels that we have on the screen. Let's say it's 10, 10 uh, 24 by 768, and you kind of compute out how large that picture is. You, it, looking for the 64-bit adder that's actually going to be performing the add, you actually don't have enough pixels on the screen to represent that adder. Right? That's how inefficiently the hardware is being used. Uh, in in uh, in terms of uh, actually, Rob, are you recording this? Yes, it is being recorded. Okay, great. So you, you actually find that the 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 amount of hardware that's actually being dedicated to the um, 
to the uh, uh, actual computation you're trying to do is very, very little, right? Fundamentally, you're spending most of your time in everything else. So what is everything else? Well, there are caches, there are instruction fetch units, there are uh, multiple redundant execution units because you want to be able to catch up when you actually have instruction level parallelism and so on. So what really is going on here is we're consuming a huge amount of hardware to make the, the, to make the part easier to program. Likewise, you know, if you go out to the fully dedicated hardware with that, that 64-bit ad, and maybe 64 bits is not what I need. I really need a 3-bit ad, right? I'm going to go and customize the hardware to be exactly what I need, and I can get many orders of magnitude efficiency because of that, uh, increase in efficiency because of that. Can you click once more, Rob? All right, and so we have kind of two choices in, in this world of hardware acceleration. One is dedicated hardware, which we, we call ASICs or application-specific integrated circuits. These are going to be, uh, you know, very, very specialized. And we have FPGAs, which can get kind of within an order magnitude of, of an ASIC per, uh, in, in terms of uh, efficiency. But because they're reprogrammable, at, at least at the circuit level, uh, we get some, some uh, inefficiency relative to an ASIC. All right, next slide. So if we go to look at what, you know, if we compare ASICs with FPGAs, you know, ASIC is hardware logic for specific functionality. It's 10 times better than the FPGAs in area and cycle time. So there's no one's, no one's going to dispute that, um, at, at least traditionally. It turns out cycle time wise, we are, uh, FPGAs are getting a lot closer. Um, FPGAs are lookup table based. They're dual ported memories, configurable routing. So, you know, the 10 times worse on that order uh, in an area at least and, and oftentimes in cycle time. Next slide or next click. All right. However, one thing that people don't really account for is when I go and do an ASIC, in order for me to get that 10 times benefit in, in especially cycle time, but sometimes in area, I actually have to put a significant amount of engineering work in. I mean, it's a lot of work, lots of people involved. You know, Mark Horowitz from Stanford will tell you, you know, it's kind of $50 million is the minimum you need to put in to get a reasonable ASIC out. Next click. Well, in FPGA, I can trade off area and performance. Actually, Rob, just click through this whole thing um, that you don't, okay. So the ASIC, you know, it's specific to the implemented circuit. The FPGA can configure it at any circuit. The ASIC is unchangeable for functionality or bugs. So if I want to add functionality, I want to fix a bug, you know, I, I need to, um, I can't do that in ASIC. Obviously, in FPGAs, you can. ASIC will order months from the code to chips. If I've got fully working code and I need to go through the back end of that, you know, to get it out to a chip, we're talking order months minimum, right? Because, you know, in fact, the traditional lead time for if I if I start fabbing something to the time I get it out is order 20 weeks. I mean, it's a long time. Uh, FPGA is obviously ordered from code to chips where we're talking order hours. Um, ASICs have these high, high NREs and, and FPGAs have high volume. So the first parts, uh, they tend to be the first parts out on a specific technology node. So you actually have a technology node advantage uh, in an FPGA. Next, can you click once? And you have, the ASIC has this weird potential of holding back algorithms because you've got this ASIC, it's a lot better than the software. I'm going to keep on using the ASIC even though I've devised a, a better algorithm that may give me a factor of two or four better, but it still may be worthwhile for me to use the ASIC because I have it. The FPJ, obviously, I can go and make that change as, as I need to. <clears throat> Next click. So the ASICs really only work well when you know exactly what you need and it doesn't change, which are both generally not true in a data center. And this is really why FPGAs work better for us. Next click. So looking at the Catapult V1 accelerator card, um, we've got a Altera Stratix 5 uh, uh, D5 chip. This, For those of you who don't know FPGAs, this doesn't matter too much. What's important to you is we've got these 172,000 ALMs, 2K, M20Ks, and about 1,600 DSPs. That's really, these are the resources that are available to you on the FPGA. It's got 8 gigabytes of DDR3 uh, 1333 uh, DRAM. Uh, it's got a configuration flash. It's got a single PCIe Gen 3 by 8 and it's got eight lanes of transceivers to mini SAS connectors. This basically allows us to have a north, south, east, west connection uh, from the FPGA to other FPGAs. All right, next, next slide. So if we look at the configuration of what that, 
how we configure these things, we do wire them up into a six by eight torus. Um, this allows the FPGAs to kind of form a, a gang or a team of, of 60, uh, 48 FPGAs that all can work together. Right, so this is actually pretty convenient. Uh, it allows us to have kind of scalable kinds of operations. And it, it, it offers us kind of an interesting possibility in terms of what we can do. So imagine if I want to do some networking research, I want to model a switch. Um, that switch um, could be, uh, could you go back to the previous slide? That switch could be implemented by that center FPGA and the uh, the uh, the clients of that switch could be the four FPGAs around it, right? So this is uh, something that you could potentially do in this configuration. All right, next slide. All right, so looking at what we can do with this particular configuration, I can actually map multiple, uh, well, I can map uh, 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 an application across multiple FPGAs. So in this particular figure, uh, when we first did this for Bing, we actually uh, put um, the Bing ranking algorithm across seven FPGAs plus one spare. That would be kind of a row inside of our six by eight torus. But, you know, if I, you know, have other things to do, I might put a math accelerator, uh, you know, in another corner of my, of my torus, Bitcoin mining, you know, computer vision service, whatever I like and kind of map these things across the FPGAs or across this fabric of FPGAs, right? So this just allows me to dynamically figure out what I want to do and, and go and map things appropriately. Next slide. So if you look at how we partition um, our, our, our design uh, inside of the, the FPGA, what we do is we actually essentially are building um, what we're now calling internally a silicon OS, but we call it a shell uh, it, because in, in this particular instance, because it, it is simpler. But if you think of what a shell really is, is it abstracts up the interfaces uh, from uh, what we, uh, it abstracts the interfaces so they become simpler to use. So if, if those, any of you who have actually used FPGAs before know that, you know, dealing with PCIe, you've got to actually, you know, put the appropriate signals in at the appropriate time. Likewise with the DRAM, you have to just do, you know, there's a lot of timing dependence. There's a lot of things that are specific to the IP block that's implementing PCIe or DDR or the serial light three, right? So fundamentally what we do is we abstract these up. We have a much more, a much simpler FIFO interface. Timing doesn't matter. And you kind of just operate against these particular interfaces and, you know, uh, save yourself a lot of time. Our application we call the role. So we've got a shell which is on the outside. We've got a role on the inside. The role is really your application, whatever you want to do, and uh, you basically program that role and you rely on the shell to provide the the services uh, that you need to interact with the outside world. All right, next slide. So the first application that we did within uh, Microsoft is putting a, a Bing application um, in that uh, in as a role. Next slide. So let's talk about what Bing did uh, in the FPGA. Next slide. So if you look at how search works, and, and basically all search engines work in this way, you know, at, at a high level at least, you can think of search being very, very grossly broken up into two parts. And of course, real search is much more complicated than this. But if I have a query, you know, I type in a query, let's say I type in Microsoft Research, what happens is that query goes and goes, gets broadcast across a large number of, of, serv uh, uh, of servers. And those servers now basically cache the entire internet. So we have a copy and Google has a copy and Yahoo has a copy of, of the entire internet or you know whatever part of the internet uh, they're searching. And we'll go and, and take that query and we'll go and, uh, and figure out uh, where that query uh, actually exists inside of the pages of this cache of the internet that we have, right? And so the query tends, the selection tends to be fairly simple. Uh, the selection could be just looking that, make sure that the query terms uh, actually exist in the pages that we're, we're potentially gonna look at. Then we're gonna have, we're gonna down select from the billions and billions of documents that we have inside of, uh, uh, across the internet down to a few, a small number, let's say a thousand or 2000 or 4,000, something like that those selected documents now get sent to ranking as a service. And what happens with ranking is for each one of those pages, we generate a 32-bit number, a floating point number, let's say, which kind of is our guess of how relevant this page is to your query, 
right? And then the sim what happens simply after that is we go and sort the, those 32-bit floats, and the one that's the highest rank, the most relevant, appears at the top of your page, all right? So what we did initially within, within Microsoft with FPGAs is we want an accelerated ranking. Next slide. And next slide. So if we go and look at what ranking is, ranking is composed of, of three main components, right? And these three main components are uh, feature extraction, which are kind of, these are machine learning features that we extract from the, the particular uh, document relative to the query. Then we have these things called freeform expressions, which are human written kind of combinations of these features. So you can imagine someone saying this feature is, is double, double the importance of another feature. So what I might do is I might uh, the, a freeform expression, maybe two times <coughs> feature one plus feature two, something like something like that. And then once you get all of these features uh, through, you know, kind of on the order of 6,000 features, then we go into a machine learned scoring uh, algorithm, which then goes and produces the score. So this particular example of what a feature might, looks like, might look like, we've got this field programmable gate array page from Wikipedia. All right, let's say our query is FPGA configuration. Can you click one? What will happen is one very simple feature is the number of occurrences of that term on the page. So let's say the number of occurrences of, of the first term, which is FPGA, we see seven of those. Click one more. Obviously, the next feature may be the, the number of occurrences of the second occurrence, uh, the second query term configuration. So we see four. Click once more. And then you have the number of tuples, um, which is the number of FPGA configurations back to back, right? Uh, FPGA configuration, we see one of those. Click once more. So how do we go and implement this, uh, that, that feature extraction? Well, the simple thing is we have a little finite state machine that runs for each one of those features, or at least one of each one of those feature groups. So we may have a number of occurrences. We may have one finite state machine that can handle the number of query terms we handle. But, you know, we, we can imagine each one of these is implemented logically in its own little finite state machine. And so in this particular case, that's exactly what we did. Uh, our documents and the, uh, and the query would come over PCIe. The document's compressed a little bit, so we decompress it, and then we basically spread that document across each one of these finite state machines um, along with the query. And then as the as the as each one of these little finite state machines computes the feature that it's supposed to compute, we get those features, we gather them up in a feature gathering network, and then we, we send them to the next stage. So, you know, this is, I just want to give a high-level view of, of what this computation might look like. And so FPGAs are great at implementing this large number of small little features. All right, next slide. So in 2013, we went and bought 1,632 of these servers to act as a pilot. Um, and we deployed them in a production data center. And what we did is we went and, uh, well, and we ran a pilot on it. And so this is, these are actual pictures of the data center servers. And, you know, these are pictures of our, uh, of the, the FPGAs that were deployed there. Next slide. So in the end, the results were really good. Um, and these were published in ISCA 2014. We were able to double the throughput of the, uh, of our, our servers uh, using this single FP. So one FPGA per server allowed us to double the throughput compared to software. Um, or we were able to reduce the latency by 29%. So if doubling the throughput is keeping the latency at what the, the latency that we wanted to have uh, going through this computation, so that's the double throughput, and then 29% if we if we kept the queries at kind of what we were used to uh, in software, we could reduce latency by 29%. So these are actually very significant results uh, within the search uh, within Bing. So the, we did this all with less than 30% additional cost. It's actually less than 30%, but this is the, the number we can tell you. Otherwise, you would be able to guess what we pay for our FPGAs. Less than 25 watts of power and, and, and uh, zero hardware failures over the, uh, the search. And this is really, this was running about 30,000 lines of C++ code is what we were replacing with this. Next slide. So once we got a very successful Bing uh, pilot, uh, we were going to deploy this, right? So this was in October, November of, of 2013. We said, okay, 
you know, management, we, you know, here are the results, you know, you, we met the criteria that were set out. Actually, we exceeded the criteria that were set out for deployment. How do we go and deploy? And at the time, Microsoft was was converging their SKUs. So it turns out in the past, Bing would define their own, you know, servers. Um, Azure would define their own servers and, and every group would define their own servers. There was a, a, a movement within Microsoft to converge on a single server, as few servers as possible. And this has a lot of benefits um, in terms of um, being able to, uh, you know, have a better, easier supply chain. You know, you have more volume. You, you don't have to, and you have this fungibility where, you know, if I bought a bunch of servers for, for Bing and I don't need them, then Azure could potentially use them and so on. So there, there's a lot of potential benefits to this. So the question then was, could other groups, especially Azure that buys the most servers, could other groups use the FPGAs as well? And so one of my jobs when I, when I got here was to go and sell FPGAs to the rest of the company. Uh, I went and talked to all of the relevant groups and, uh, and actually uh, talking to the networking team, we discovered that they really wanted encryption and they wanted to accelerate software-defined networking. So we, we knew that we couldn't support these things, at least in the inline fashion that Azure Networking wanted to do them on a single, on, on the board that we had already designed. And so we went and redesigned the system around kind of the joint unified uh, requirements from both Bing and, and Azure. Next slide. So this is the result. Um, this is the Catapult Bing, uh, 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 Azure being Catapult V2 card, um, logically what is happening in this card is, is what is shown on the, on the left there in the cartoon. Um, basically, your FPGA now sits in between the NIC and the switch, the data center switch. So every packet that goes in and out of the server goes through the FPGA. In addition, we have two by eight Gen 3s uh, that talk between the CPU and the FPGA. And so this is what we actually went and deployed. Next slide. So what this does is this allows all of our FPGAs to connect to uh, every other server in the data center. In fact, not just in the data center, but to every other server, uh, you know, in the world because we can send uh, um, packets, Ethernet packets, uh, IP packets uh, through this path. All right, so um, FPGAs communicate directly with each other. There's no software involved and there's no system memory involved. So these are very, very fast connections. Next slide. All right, so now let's look at what Azure, uh, Microsoft Azure is doing with these. Next slide. So Azure's project in the FPGA is called SmartNIC. Um, we use an FPGA to, uh, for reconfigurable functions within the networking stack, uh, within networking. So we wanna roll out hardware as we do software. So it turns out networking, uh, for those of you who don't do networking research, networking actually changes very, very rapidly. There's new features being added all the time, you know, performance is being tuned and so on. And so the traditional kind of hardware static ASIC NIC uh, that, that only does, you know, kind of whatever was, was baked in when the, when the ASIC was done, that doesn't work as, as well as we would like. And we'd like to actually have more reconfigurability, at least for part of the, the NIC function. There's going to be some NIC functionality that does not change, makes a lot of sense to leave that in hard ASIC logic, but there's a lot of logic that does want to change. And so thereby having that FPGA as a bump in the wire would between the NIC and the Tor is very, very useful. So the, one of the first things we did uh, with networking is we did something called generic flow table. Um, this is a language to program SDN software defined networking into hardware, uh, uses connections and, and structured actions as primitives. So basically what we do is we go and classify packets. We say, hey, this packet belongs to a specific flow. And then based on that flow, we go and perform operations on that packet. Um, so SmartNIC can also do crypto quas, storage acceleration and more. So next slide. So people, you know, one, one thing that you might be thinking is, okay, well, Microsoft deployed V2. Well, why would we wanna work on V1? So there's a lot of good reasons to work on V1. So the academic program is on V1, but V2 is deployed. But so the shell interface is going to be identical. We, we built an academic shell. The intention is that, you know, when we go and provide the access to V2, we'll provide a, a shell that's gonna be very similar, right? 
So the, the goal is, is to be to be fairly identical, although there, there will be changes. You know, the, the intention is that you'll be able to run stuff that you were running in V1 on V2. The other thing is, is V2 has far fewer resources left over for the role. So it turns out that when we went and put, we had to put two 40 gig max into that FPGA plus what we call a network bridge that bridges between the two Macs and the FPGA. If you go and read our 2016 paper, that actually consumed a huge amount of space in the FPGA, which means less space for you as an academic researcher to use, right? So in reality, you know, that, you, you know, being adhering to the Ethernet Mac standard, you know, was what is a very expensive thing, which we, you know, uh, is probably not going to be that useful for, for a lot of research. Uh, we're also handing out V1 boards. We can't hand out the V2 boards yet. So basically, we can give you uh, V1 boards. Uh, we, we have a, a few, a couple of hundred. Um, if you guys want to uh, write us a proposal and we like the proposal, we're happy to send you some of those V1 boards. However, we'd strongly recommend that rather than you trying to get the V1 board, get a server that you can plug it into, get everything all set up, we'd recommend that you use the ones that are intact, that, that are easy and, uh, to use and you just log into, just like you would do a, a cloud. So V1 is better for research into Taurus local computations, right? You can you can exploit locality. And when V2 goes public, those who have made good progress on V1 is, are going to get priority on V2. So, so these are the reasons why to work in V1. Next slide. And sorry, actually, what would be the advantages to us users uh, with V2? Uh, say that once more. So what would be the advantages uh, to us users with V2, since there are fewer resources. So uh, what would be the advantages compared to V1? So V2 is, you know, it would be, you'd be using the same structure that Azure is using internally. Um, you could now go and, and create Ethernet packets. So you, now you could potentially um, uh, be talking to a software server e more, much more easily. Right, so I could have software running on one side, and then you know you're talking to the FPGA. That software could be running even at your home institution or around the world. It doesn't have to be local, right? So communication within V1's got to be in the within those 48 FPGAs that are connected together. So there are some advantages to V2, but at least considering the size of the FPGA, basically the shell in V2 takes roughly 40% of the area. The shell in, in V1, um, uh, Ray, what's the current size? Do you know a fraction of the resources? Ray, are you there? Hello? No, uh, yeah. I, I don't I have no idea. Okay. All right. So I, I think that the resources in V1, uh, the V1 shell, are, are more like 20 or 25 percent. So you, you save yourself, you know, on the order of 15 to 20 percent. Uh, that, that's an estimate because I, I don't know where we are right now. OK, next slide. Oh, so conclusions, you know, we're at the dawn of a new era that we we're looking at this configurable cloud. So we have programmable logic is really playing a central role in, in what we're doing in Microsoft's data centers. And we believe that this is going to be true uh, in other data centers as well. It really enables us to do new application service to be very cost effective. Uh, and we can do this very quickly because it's reconfigurable hardware. Um, it really changes the system architecture, both in the server and at the cloud scale. All right. So next slide. So one thing that I do want to talk about is TAC. This is actually, uh, uh, we have this project called FPGA Accelerator Research Infrastructure Cloud. It's actually an NSF funded project. I, I got this uh, project funded as a professor before I left UT and I'm continuing to manage it. But basically the catapult systems that we're talking about are, are actually sitting in TAC. Next slide. So the goal of Fabrics is really to provide high-end, high-skill FPGA platforms for open, open academic research. So this is both the FPGA systems themselves and the CAD tools and servers to run on. So one of the problems that I, I had when I was starting off doing FPGA research is, you know, I had to go and get a license, download the tools, get the license server to work, make sure the license server continued to work. Most of the time, the license would expire right before the paper was due. I mean as Murphy's Law <clears throat> would indicate, that's exactly the wrong time. And that's when, you know, there's no one to actually provide, get you the licenses back. So at least we, we have the problem too, we have to, you know, maintain licenses, but, you know, we do it, uh, you know, uh, uh, once and, and it's useful for everyone. We place these systems in the University of Texas Supercomputer Center. So you just log in and go. It's as if you were working in a company that's supporting FPGAs. You don't have to deal with a lot of the maintenance and dealing with the machines and all this yourself. Um, 
It enables a lot of things. It allows us to amortize the overhead of acquisition, installation, running the FPGA systems. It enables reproducibility results because now you can go and run someone else's code and they can run your code on the same machine. And it allows enables remote classes and training, exactly like, for instance, what we're doing today. Um, Open Fabric, uh, go, go to Open Fabric for instructions on how to get access. Next slide. So Fabric has got uh, a few machines in it. Uh, we've got the, the current systems are Conve MX100, uh, 9 Power 8 plus Capi plus Xilinx plus Altera plus NVIDIA cards, 384 Microsoft Catapult servers, which is what we're focusing on, and 10 uh, Intel Harp Accelerator Research Program Systems. These are the next generation, the current generation, ARIA 10 based uh, uh, hardware acceleration research program systems. And we've got two 3.5 gigahertz CAD tool servers with 256 gigabytes of DRAM. So it turns out those of you who have tried to use uh, uh, FPGA tools on your laptop, it, the, you don't have enough memory. You really need on the order of 64 gigabytes minimum to, to really be effective, 32 to 64. And the 256 plus the 3.5 gigahertz processors are really helpful here. Next slide. So the Catapult Academic Research Program Fabric, it's jointly funded by Intel and Microsoft. Um, system administration tools and servers are funded by NSF under Fabric. We provide the PCIe device driver shell, Hello World programs, individual V1 boards sent to you if you, if you like. And really what we recommend is remote access to these um, 8 times 48 servers, each with a V1 board. And this is all accessible with a one-page proposal. Just send to catapult at Microsoft.com. And of course, you know, you have to pass export control. There's a bunch of laws and regulations, but uh, most people who, most students who are in US or European uh, uh, institutions should, should be able to get access. And, and even some in, in China and India should be okay too. All right, next slide. So one of the things, there's a couple of requirements that uh, in order to get access, so what you agree to is everything you do in Fabric is open source, and you are distributing your code to us when you actually use it. So what does this mean? This means that you know you should not be going and taking your company's code or your secret startup code or whatever and running it on this platform. The intention is for this to be open research. So the requirement, you are agreeing that you have the right to, to publish this code, that it's your code, and that you will publish it to us under some sort of open source license, and we specify three different sort of open source licenses that you can you can release your code to us. So, you know, this is the whole goal here is, is to build an ecosystem to build, you know, research to in, 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 uh, to uh, encourage research in our in our uh, FPJ community. Um, getting access, every user must be vetted. So it uh, turns out FPJs and FPJ tools are U.S. export controlled. So we, we can't get around the laws. So we, we, we follow the law and we we make sure that you uh, actually should have access. You must be at least affiliated with a major university, and you're going to need to get your own Altera Intel license. Go to myaltera.com for an account. So F the one thing that is critically important here is the Fabric license allows users to publish results. It turns out if you go and read the user agreement very carefully, let's say you were to get your own license and do all your own research at home, the, the license for the, the tools that you use to for, for FPGA, this is Quartus, as well as Xilinx's of Avado, actually does not allow you to publish the results. Now, are they going to come and sue you? Probably not, but it's it's their parat. You are actually violating the license when you publish results using uh, the standard tools, using the standard license. If you go through Fabric, we've actually removed that requirement, uh, and you are allowed to publish your results. So that's something that you know is, is very useful. All right, next slide. I think that we're done, but, and we're currently available. We have many users already, so please send your one-page proposals to catapult at Microsoft.com. All right, are there any questions? Uh, one on V2. So do I understand correctly this, this will allow us to have use cases where the FPGA is directly communicating via the Ethernet network? So this one does not, the V1 does not attach to the Ethernet network. The only attachment is through these uh, these serial cables, um, which are, are roughly uh, 10 gigabit per, uh, the, 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 the cable itself, which has two connections, each at six gigabit per second. So you got roughly 12 gigabit per second of bandwidth. Um, so they can talk to each other, but they do not talk to Ethernet directly. So if you wanted to go through Ethernet, you'd have to go through software. That, well, that's the easy way. It turns out if you really want to work, um, you could actually t communicate to the NIC 
over PCIe from the FPGA, but that's, there is some work involved for you to do that. Great, thank you. Juan, another question, if I may, on V2. Uh, if I understand correctly, uh, the, why the, the issue or the, the reason why the shell takes more uh, space on the V2 FPGA is because of this uh, uh, added capabilities. Uh, are you thinking on um, on a setup where we could opt out of uh, using Ethernet and have just the capabilities that the VN offers, but uh, and and then have the shell use fewer resources? So I, sorry, I, I didn't understand that. So the shell, at least, if, so in V2, in order to talk to Ethernet, we instantiate a 40 gig Mac in uh, and actually have to instantiate two 40 gig Macs inside the FPGA. Now, of course, if you don't want to talk to the NIC, you just want to talk to the uh, to the Tor, you can instantiate one 40 gig Mac. But, and if, I guess you could also instantiate a smaller Mac. If you only need a 10 gig, for example, you can instantiate a 10 gig Mac. But can, can you, uh, given that, can you ask your question again? Uh, yeah, so would it be possible to get rid of Macs at all, um, altogether? So basically have uh, the same PCI Express only communication channel than on V1? and thus have yeah. the roughly same amount of resource utilization for the shell itself than on VBAN? Yes, you could do that, but now you cannot communicate over the Ethernet. So uh, yeah, basically it's, clear. it's just a PCI attached. Yeah, so then you might as well use the cards that we have. You just ignore the you ignore the connections, right? You ignore the uh, the, the, the logical, uh, the, the uh, network connections, and you're fine, right? It's the same thing. It turns out V2 and V1 use exactly the same FPGA. So you're not going to get any more resources because you've got a newer FPGA or a bigger FPGA. I see. So does, right. that, does that make sense? So if you're just doing PCIe, V1 is identical to V2. Uh, in terms of, oh, there's only one PCIe connection, one by eight. V2's got two, but, you know, I think that also is probably, you know, one is probably sufficient for research at least. That's clear. Thank you. A uh, question about uh, V1. Uh, this is David. Um, hey, Derek, uh, for the V1, uh, so did I hear you say the maximum is 12 gigabits per sec? Yeah, so right now, the, okay, let, yeah, let me be, I'll, I'll be very precise. So the transceivers on the machine, on the FPGAs that are deployed intact, are rated to 14 gigabit per second. However, we never got it to go beyond six gigabit per second because six gigabit was enough for us to do our experiments. So theoretically, you could go to 10 or 12 or even potentially 14. But if you want to use the engineering work that we've already done, stick with the six gigabit per second. So that's, does that answer the question? Yeah, that, that answers the question. Thank you. Um, I have another question. Um, this is regarding, actually, it doesn't matter what version, V1 or V2, but um, regarding OpenCL, when is it going to be uh, ready? I was speaking to um, Rob initially, but I wasn't quite sure when the date is set. So we're actually getting very close to, to OpenCL being fully complete. I think OpenCL, in there, there's a couple of restrictions with the OpenCL. And so, Rob, correct me if I'm wrong in, in here, because I haven't, I don't know the exact, the current last week's status, right? But um, we can, OpenCL works across PCIe and works to the DRAM, but only with a limited amount of DRAM. I think it was either two gigabytes or four gigabytes instead of the full eight gigabytes. Four Is that gigabyte. correct, Rob? Yeah, we got to four. Um, we're very we close to, four. to, we're very close okay. to eight. Um, and in fact, that really just happened uh, Wednesday. So um, we, we don't have a firm date, but we are hoping within the next couple of weeks we'll be able to have something. Yeah. So we're working very closely with Altera, who's doing this port of OpenCL, and we, we've gotten across a couple of very interesting hurdles, but I, I think we're, we're in the, the final stretch right now. So, oh, one last question. I'm sorry. Also about OpenCL. Yeah. Um, so, is it going to support FPGA to FPGA um, sort of communication uh, for the OpenCL BSP? Yeah. So, what the the OpenCL BSP that we're working on right now is going to provide the ability to communicate across the serial like the, the the serial connections, right? Those Taurus connections. 
So what it'll do is you'll see essentially four FIFOs that you can enqueue from and dequeue from. Uh, well, four in each direction, right? Um, and so, yes, you from OpenCL, you will be able to communicate to, to other FPGAs. That, that's wonderful. <laughs> All right, thanks yeah. a lot. Yeah, yep. I look forward to it. Yeah, so we'll, we'll as soon as that's available, we'll send an announcement out to, to everyone who's on this tutorial, as well as other others on our email list, so. Uh, All right. Any other any other questions? Yeah, uh, uh, I was wondering if uh, there are some examples for characterizing the memory, or do we have to do it, or uh, if you have any examples. So because, you're uh, breaking up for me. I, I can't really. I mean, can anyone else hear? Me? Or is this just me, or is this him? No, he's he's breaking up pretty bad. Yeah. Can you can you restate your question? Yeah, uh, so I was wondering if there are any examples for uh, uh, DRAM characterization because you are separating the DRAM with the shell. So how do we profile it? So, uh, do you have any examples? Or do we have to figure that out? So you're, you're, you're still breaking up very heavily. Can you type your question into the text box? Do, do you have that ability? Yeah, so if, if you yeah. can, can you text it? Oh, there's no option. Oh. All right, and so yeah. does anyone else have, while he's typing that, does, are there other questions? Uh, yeah, one more question. Are there any other specific examples that are being made available um, under the tag platform? Yes, uh, there, so there are a set of examples, essentially Hello World programs. So there was an example that basically uh, exercised all of the interfaces, right? You know, kind of PCIe to DRAM. I forgot exactly what it was. I think we're writing, you know, stuff from over PCI into DRAM and reading it back. Or, and then there was uh, something that actually exercises the, the serial light threes, the, the Taurus cables as well. Okay. Uh, one other thing, just to write to that. So I'm assuming that taking some examples from, I don't know, Altera's um, website could possibly work with this? Yes, but the, the ones from Altera's website would not be ported to our shell, right? So you would need to then go and, and uh, monkey with our shell to, to get that in. But yes, you, you should be able to take examples from Altera's website and other, other examples uh, and just be able to run them on this FPGA. Uh, would that also apply for the OpenCL version? Oh no. Uh, you're saying are there other examples with OpenCL? Right. So could I also take, let's say, some OpenCL examples from Altera's website and um, run on Catapult? Because I would think, yes, yeah, because yeah. it's all OpenCL, right? So <laughs> yes, okay. yes. So the whole intention of OpenCL is to abstract away the actual board, right? And so the OpenCL examples you'll see on Altera's website are are communicate over PCIe. I think a lot of I don't know if a lot of them have you know assume an FPGA DRAM. And certainly most of them do not assume a, a, uh, a Taurus cable. But uh, yeah, I think that at least the PCIe stuff, you should have no problems running. OK, thank you. OK, so the question came up uh, in text. Do you have any examples of profiling DRAM since shell is abstracted? Actually, there is a profiler so that we can characterize the memory. So you're, you're basically interested in seeing whether or not you can kind of uh, uh, play with the DRAM directly. Um, we, we should support that, um, meaning, but you would probably have to remove our shell. You probably have to go and program things directly on the FPGA, right? So you just remove the shell and, and, but then you're kind of on your own, uh, to do that. Uh, we, we, we don't support that directly, but it's technically possible. And if you want to do, I know that some people are, want to do kind of DRAM profiling. This is something where, especially if you want to swap out the DRAM, the DRAMs themselves, yourself, uh, we could potentially send you a board, you know, send us a proposal. But I think because we've got so many uh, servers, you could actually go through and, and test the DRAM on each one of the each one of the FPGA cards that we have over time, right? What we do right now is we we mostly statically assign a particular user a FPGA. That way, you know, we, we've got enough of them that we can do that today. Over time, we're going to have to timeshare. But, you know, we could potentially give you, you know, access for an hour or two to each uh, to each FPGA so that you could characterize that DRAM. So write to us and we can discuss that.
uh, in more detail. All right, any other questions? Okay, so it okay. sounds like we, go ahead. Well, I was just, just going to say thanks, Derek. Uh, we we some we, we have had a request for a break, um, so uh, let's let's take five minutes, uh, and at uh, fifty five uh, five till the hour, uh, we'll start up with Ray. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. We'll just hang here, and we'll. Thanks, uh, Derek. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. Sorry it took longer than I should have, but... Oh, no worries. All right. Yep. All right. Bye. Okay. Okay. So, I'm Ray, and I'm the new developer of Catapult Academ Academic Shell, replacing Dan Zhang. So, today, I would like to introduce uh, the architecture of Catapult Academic Shell. So, uh, as Derek mentioned before, we have shell and a row. And the row is basically the user application, and the shell is a wrapper around the row, uh, which handles the low-level I.O. protocols, and it, expo expo and it exposes the simple FIFO interfaces to the users. And within the shell, there are four major interfaces, PCIe registers, PCIe DMA, DRAM, and serialized 3. Uh, today I will introduce them, them one by one. So, before introducing them in detail, I would like to give a, an overview of these interfaces and their performance. So PCIe Express provides a high-speed bidirectional communication. And each board uh, and the uh, band, theoretical bandwidth is 4 gigabyte per second each direction. In real world, uh, it's about 3 gigabyte per second each direction which means 6 gigabytes per second in aggregate. And each board has two channels of 4 gigabyte DDR3 memory. And the peak, ban peak ban theoretical bandwidth is 10.7 gigabytes per second per channel. In real world, uh, it's about 7 gigabytes per second for sequential write and the 9 gigabytes per, per second for sequential read per, se per channel. And the soft register is a 64-bit read-write re interface through the PCIe programmed I.O. It is de designed for low bandwidth usage and is about only one megabyte per second. And each board has four serialized three connections. Each connection is bidirectional, and it is exposed to user as a 128-bit input and output fiber. For each direction, the, uh, each connection, the peak theoretical bandwidth is 766 megabytes per second. So it's 6 gigabytes per second in aggregate. And in addition to the row, we also provide an academic simple row to further simplify the row interface. Uh, we convert the row interfaces to struct-based so that it is easier to program. Uh, we also simplify the flow control and handshaking mechanisms and remove some uncommonly used signals. And the simple row sits within the row, so it's totally optional. You are free to implement your own logic. So uh, the first, I'm going to introduce the PCIe interface. And to simplify the communication between the whole system and FPGA, Microsoft has developed a uh, slot base layered on top of the single HIP. And the slot based architecture is optimized for multi-threaded code, and it allows software running on the host to send and receive data to the FPGA at latencies in the order of microseconds. The associated synchronization mechanisms are exposed to the users. So this figure shows the, how the mechanism works. So you can see that first, the CPU places data to be processed into a kernel-based input buffer, and located it located locates in the main main memory. The second, the CPU will ring the FPGA's doorbell to inform it to receive and begin processing the data. 
the CPU thread then either put to sleep waiting on the notification or continue execution. And, this, and this three, the shell will transfer data from the CPU's memory and place it into an input buffer on the FPGA. The row then can process the process on the input buffer and write the in results into the output buffer. And number five, the FPGA will copy the contents of the output buffer into the CPU's memory in the output buffer, which is also kernel pin. And then the CPU thread will wake up and consume the process the data from FPGA. The CPU can discard the output buffer, which allows the FPGA to reuse it for the next transaction. So the figure shows the process of a single transaction of sending data to FPGA. At first, CPU writes a start signal to FPGA. And after receiving the start signal, the FPGA will send data requests to the CPU to notify it to send data. And then the CPU can send a read response to, CP, to FPGA. And note that this is the only hop which carries useful data. So there are four, uh, four hops in total, and each hop takes 250 to 300 nanoseconds, but only one hop carries useful data. So if a transaction only sends a little data, then only one fourth time of the transaction is sending useful data, which is very inefficient. So we need large transactions to amortize the cost of the hop latency. So put it together, the, this figure shows a complete round trip, including sending data and receiving the results. And there are seven hops in total, results in a two microsecond delay. During this time, the software is waiting for FPGA to finish. Waiting for done signal can be performed through polling, which is CPU intensive, or interrupt, which is relatively slow. Know that the software threads are independent of each other. Each thread ma manages its own set of private slots. For each slot, software fills input slot and waits for FPGA to process data and fill, in, fill into output slot. So it is recommended to use multiple logical threads. And when one thread is waiting for the output, another thread can be writing the slot. So there is always some data to send, and the throughput can be maximized. So we've talked about the long latency it takes to finish a round trip. So how do we ease the issue? And a naive implementation is that the FPGA process each task in serial. It means the next transaction cannot be processed until the previous, previous one is finished. As you can see in the timeline, there are huge intervals between the two useful hops, which is marked green. And the hop latency is not hidden at all. So a better implementation is to support two transactions in parallel. So the real transfer of data can start as soon as the done signal of the previous task is received. But it's still not fully high the hop latency. So the best implementation is to support many transactions in parallel. The real transfer of a transaction can start as soon as the data transfer of the previous, uh, previous task is done. So, uh, but, it, but each transaction requires a 64, 64 kilobyte buffer to be reserved on FPGA, which will consume a lot of FPGA resource. So we choose to implement the two transactions in parallel. So this picture gives a more detailed view of the current slot-based implementation. So to mitigate FPGA and CPU latency, we support multiple tasks in flight. By using double buffering, two tasks can send data to FPGA and consume the sense data at the same time, like task three and task two. 
shown in the figure. And similarly, two tasks can send result back to host and write the result at the same time, like task one and task two. And we have 64, 64 input and output buffer pairs on the host side, like in the, in the left. And uh, we have each slot can store up to 64 kilobytes of data. Okay, so what's the PCIe interface exposed to the user? It turns out that it is simply a 128-bit FIFO interface and it's separated for input and output. Uh, but the slots do not have to be accessed in any particular order. The data movement from a single slot will logically finish movement before another slot data movement logically starts, which means that the message sent to a given slot must complete before starting another message. So we first give a list of the interfaces. Uh, there are five input signals and one output signal. Maybe it will be better to understand it through a timing diagram. So when a row is ready to accept a message, it has to first de-assert the PCIe fallout. So when, and when the shell see the PCIe fallout if the alert is, it will then, and, and the shell has something, uh, something available to, to deliver, and it, then it will alert the PCIe write enable in. So PCIe write enable in is alerted only when the PCIe fallout is zero and a valid message is available. And the other information will be presented on the same time, like PCIe slot in, which denotes the slot number where the data comes from and the data on the PCIe data in. And PCIe last in will only be asserted on the last 16 byte word of the message. Note that the slot contains one message and it can be 32 byte to 64 kilobyte in size. In the hardware current in the current hardware implementation, all messages must be a multiple of 16 bytes. We reserve an extra signal, PCIe pad bytes in, to support non-16 byte aligned messages in future releases. But currently, this signal should be set to zero. And similarly, we give a list of FPGA to CPU interface. And uh, there are five output signals and one input signal. Again, we are understand it through diagram. So when the row has a valid message to send out, it should de-assert the PCIe empty out and present the other information like PCIe data out, like slot number, something else at the same time. So when the shell see it, and the shell is ready to accept a message, it will assert the PCIe read enable in. So PCIe read enable in is asserted only when PCIe empty out is de-asserted, and when the shell is ready to accept a word of data. Note that if the shell is ready to accept a word, the PCIe read enable in will be asserted in the same cycle, it's in the same cycle, in which the PCIe empty out is de-alerted. So the row can decide whether to switch to the next word based on the PCIe read enable in. So we simplify the PCIe interface in the simple row. We basically pack the signals into structures to enhance programmability. As you can see, instead of seven signals with different widths on the left. Now there are only two signals on the right. And all the messages info is packed into a packet and associated with a signal to denote whether the row or the shell is ready to accept the message. Okay, so in addition to the PCIe slot-based implementation, the shell also exposes a soft register interface. 
that allows a simple register-based communication between the software and the row. It is designed for low bandwidth operations, as we mentioned before, <coughs> such as read-write performance counters, the config row parameters, or start and stop tests. So typically, it is used during the runtime initialization or to query the FPGA status or statistics. The row logic can either process the request or choose to ignore it, but no indication returned to software. There is no back pressure mechanism available to prevent the soft register write from occurring. And here is the soft register interface. Well, again, we will introduce it through a timing diagram. It is actually very simple. Uh, when the soft register, uh, when the host launch a soft register write, the shell will assert the soft register write in and present the address on the address in and the data on the data in at the same time. The row can choose to write the data into a register or just ignore it. It's up to, it's up to the row. And for the reading diagram, uh, it's very similar. Uh, when the host launch a read, and it will assert the, the shell will assert the reading and present the address on the address in. And several cycles later, the, the row should respond to the data. Note that the row should respond to the data within 1,000 clock cycles or a timed out PCIe response will be issued, resulting in undefined, undefined behavior. And the P top register write in and read in will not be asserted simultaneously. So we also <coughs> simplify the soft register interface in a simple row. We use the request and response model. We pack all the input signals into a soft register request and output signal into the response. <coughs> so uh, Microsoft also provide a generic split-phase DRAM interface which wraps up the Altara Avalon. It, it is intended to insulate the users from the bus specific, specific protocols. As you can see in the figure, on top of a uh, four gigabyte DDR3, which is a real memory, there is a DDR3 memory controller, which exposes the Altara Avalon interface. And we provide a UMI to Avalon adapter to standardize the interface and transfer it from DDR3 clock domain to user clock domain, which makes the interface easier to use. The users now don't need to worry about the protocol of the platform issues. So here is the list of the UMI interface. It is split, it is split into two parts, the command interface and the data interface. And here's a list of the, data, uh, the command interface, including, including the address and the size. The address is the starting, starting byte address of the request, and the size is the size of the memory request in bytes. And here's the data interface. Uh, we also, I will also introduce this through a timing diagram. So when a row wants to read the memory, it should first assert the UMI raise out and de assert the UMI write out. Uh, the other command info, like uh, address out and size, should be provided at the same time. And note that the address must be aligned to 64 bytes and the size must be multiple of 64 bytes. And the share will assert UMI grant in <laughs> when it accepts the request. And several cycles later, if the data is delivered from the memory and is available in the shell, it would, the shell would assert UMI read ready in. To consume the data, row should assert UMI read enable out. 
then the 64-byte word of data can be accepted per cycle. It is only safe to strobe this when UMI read in is asserted. So the UMI interface, the, all the data is 512 five bits, which is 64 bytes in width. And <clears throat> to write the memory, uh, it is also handled over a split interface. To launch a write, the row should assert the UMI race out first. And, uh, and also the UMI write out and provide the address and the size. When there is sufficient space to write a 64 byte word of data, the UMI write ready in will be asserted by shell. So when the UMI write ready in is valid, the row should present a valid data word on the UMI write data out and, uh, and the mask out and assert the UMI write enable out. The UMI grant in is used to indicate that the shell is accept, has accepted the command request. And the row can write data prior, prior to receiving the UMI grant in, as long as the UMI write ready in is alerted. So we also, we implement a logic to further simplify the UMI interface into a FIFO-like interface in a simple row. We abstract the UMI interface with a simple memory response model. The memory, memory request grant in indicates that the shell has accepted the request. And the memory response grant out tells the shell that the row has accepted the response. So, so far we can communicate between the FPGA and host. We can communicate between FPGA and its memory. And a more powerful feature, as mentioned before, is to communicate between FPGAs. It is supported by the Catapult Taurus network. And each board has a four bi-directional point-to-point -point serialized three lanes, enabling the boards to directly communicate with other boards in a two-dimensional six times eight torus network. And each logical serialized three lane is physically implemented with two pairs of six gigabit per second links in each direction. <laughs> so for a maximum of 1.5 gigabyte per second for each lane. And so within the board, there is a serialized three streaming mega core function, which provides high speed data transaction. As shown in the figure, uh, this is provided by Otara and the streaming mega core function will uh, do a serial data transfer between FPGAs. And our shell abstracts the low level Otara function, presenting a simple send receive FIFO based interface for each lane. And the flow control is not implemented. So uh, the lanes receiving packets cannot back pressure. Each direction is split into virtual channels through time, divi time division multiplexing. The main data channel and an out of band data channel. The out of band data channel is intended for implementing a credit based flow control scheme. And it is allocated one sixteenth of the bandwidth. So here's the list of uh, serialized three interface. It is actually very simple. And when data arrives, the valid signal will be alerted and the data associated will be present on the data signal. And the serialized in last is asserted when this data word is the last in the incoming message. Uh, the transmit interface is similar. And in addition, there is a store in. So it is used when a message word to send out 
uh, it is de-alerted when the message word is to send out is accepted by the shell. Note that there are four directions of serialized three links, east, south, west, and north, and they are totally independent, including so everything in this list is a vector of four. But in the simple role, we provide a, synchro provide a synchronization scheme, and we synchronize all the, all the directions into the user, user clock domain. So to summary, there are uh, TCIE enables the communication between CPU and interface, uh, between CPU and FPGA. So the FPGA can act as an accelerator. The host program can invoke the FPGA to accelerate critical part of the program. You can write a multi-threaded parallel algorithm to achieve high performance. Or FPGA and CPU can cooperate with each other. Imagine that uh, you are running a program on a like multi FPGA network. Then each FPGA can utilize the attached uh, CPU to finish some work or to provide some data through the PCIe link. And the UMI uh, provide a uh, provide a simple interface to manipulate the memory. So it enables the FPGA to use it to process on bigger data and to deal with a bigger problem. And with serialized three, uh, you can build a distributed algorithm and run it on multiple FPGAs and you can achieve a high, very high performance with many FPGAs. So that's all for the architecture. And for, for more information, you can go to the, this website. And if you have any questions, you can send the email to the catapult at microsoft.com. Thank you. Are there questions? Go ahead, Dave. Hi, uh, this is David. Uh, could you please explain a little bit how you were able to do the conversion from the sort of native or primitive interface to the struct data structure? Uh, you mean the Basis? simple role? Uh, I believe so. You give a few examples by code of how you were converting um, the FPGA uh, sort of, yeah, if you keep well. going. Uh, no, this is, um, yes, yeah, something like this. I was just trying to understand how this works, going yeah. from UMI to the structured depths. Yeah, so basically for the simple, so DRAM, they're a little bit complicated. We have a, uh, we have a logic implemented to convert it to the FIFO interface. And for details, you can, we provide a sample code and you can look, into the code. Basically, there we, there is a five hole inside, and we chan we we transfer the signals into the uh, into the simple row interface. Okay, thanks. Uh, we are using C plus plus. So. For the software API, we will talk uh, in the next section. Okay, so I mean C++ for the software aspect, and I'm guessing yeah. system bear log for the, the hardware. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thanks. Uh, any other question?
oh, uh, so there is only one clock in the row. And it's the clock you use for every logic in the row, uh, ex except for the zero like three. Yeah. Question? Uh, any other question? Sorry, I was talking on mute there. Um, I don't think there's any other questions. Um, thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. Uh, we hope that uh, you have found the information useful. Um, next week, we will uh, be presenting a session on uh, software APIs uh, within the Catapult environment. Um, we will be starting um, a half hour earlier than we started this week uh, due to some Scheduling conflicts uh, revolving around our ability to record and, and be able to present this later. So um, if you have questions, uh, you can throw them out to the Catapult at Microsoft uh, email address, or you can email me directly. Um, I'll be sending out uh, the invite for the session next week um, for uh, – uh, I'll be uh, a little bit later today. Uh, if you um, and then and look out, uh, we'll have a little bit of editing to do on the uh, video. But once that is complete, we'll be posting a link um, to uh, the the recording of this session along with the uh, presentations. Uh, we'll throw those out on our website. Uh, for uh, for your access for the future. So um, we appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, very much, and uh, have a uh, great weekend. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Have a Thank good you. Weekend. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.